All right, so welcome back uh, to Chapter 13, Manifest Destiny and the Road to Civil War. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, a couple more of the events in the aftermath of um, the Mexican War that play a really big role in ultimately um, leading us uh, to civil war again. Remember, I said everything about this chapter uh, has to do with the road to the Civil War and the events that happened that lead us to it. And I said how there's a lot of political decisions, uh, acts of Congress or um, or proposed acts of Congress that never became a reality uh, and the role they play in um, kind of setting up the precedent that's going to lead us to war here because we're talking about legislation and uh, legislation, of course, especially when you have a divided North and South, uh, is going to mean a lot. Each and every piece of legislation ultimately is going to favor one side. So today we're going to see why numbers are really important and how that plays a big role um, between uh, between the two sides here. So we'll get right to it. All right. So uh, first thing we're going to talk about is the California gold rush uh, and kind of the importance of that singular event. We all know it's important because gold was found and it got people to move out to California, but it all has to do with the timing of the event uh, and the discovery of gold and the reaction to it that really makes it ultimately a big problem. So here we are and the, the, the war is over. It's 1848 um, and we finished off yesterday talking about how the South is really, really mad because of something called the Wilmot Proviso, which never became a law. But it was an attachment, a rider uh, to an appropriations bill, meaning appropriations is money um, that will be used for various things. So this is added to it, um, but it doesn't make it through the Senate uh, because the Wilmot Proviso wanted all that territory uh, that is acquired through the Mexican War to be free territory. And uh, the Senate says no because, uh, you know, we have an equal balance of power in the Senate and the South is stronger there. But in the House of Representatives, the North has more power because those states are more populated. It's important for a second to get into population here. Um, the population of the North is significantly higher than the population of the South. And this goes all this all goes back to uh, immigration and modernization, how the North was having factories and was um, you know, building railroads, so basically it's more viable for people to spread around the country, and therefore it's more viable for immigrants to come in. While the immigrants are all going to the north, we have few immigrants coming to the south, which means the population in the north is going to expand at a really much faster level than in the south. So cause and effect, again, at the end of the day, that means um, that that since the, since the North has more people, they're going to have more representation in Congress. And a Northern Congress with more representation uh, means laws and acts that are going to favor abolitionist causes. So anyway, let's get into that. So under normal circumstances, the Wilmot Proviso would uh, count for very little. Like I said uh, just a minute ago, it's defeated in the Senate, and we go ahead and pass the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in the Senate. Remember, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was the agreement to end uh, the Mexican War and the Mexicans' agreement to give us all of the territories um, that, that we wanted, uh, California, etc., and the recognition of Texas as a part of the United States. So we get everything we want out of this deal. Uh, the Senate, of course, approves it, and everything is good. And like I said, normally, the Wilmot Proviso wouldn't matter. And you say, well, why does it matter um, now, since it didn't pass, but I'll get into that here in a second. Okay. The other question is, if you look at the lands that we got in the Mexican session, what's the likelihood we're going to get slavery there anyway? Okay. You got to know a little bit about the land. It's not great for farming. It's very dry. A lot of it's very dry and very hot. Uh, on top of that, if you go to the north, kind of more northern areas there, like Colorado and Utah, it's very hilly and, and mountainous with the Rocky Mountains there. So you're not talking about a place that's going to be great for, um, you know, for slavery to continue because uh, slaves do agricultural work and there's just not, there's not a good base for agriculture in this region. So you got to ask yourself, 
Is it likely slavery is going to move there anyway uh, and be viable or profitable? Yeah, probably not. So, but in January 1848, uh, all this changes really quick, again, in regards to that Wilma Proviso. Uh, changes in January 48 where gold is discovered in California. So men rush there uh, really quick in hopes of making a fortune. And uh, by 1850, California has that 60,000 number that they need. Remember, all the way back uh, in the uh, Northwest Ordinance of 1787, where he said 60,000 was needed for statehood. Really quick, they get their 60,000 people and um, they can apply for statehood. Okay, uh, this happens not literally overnight, but pretty much overnight. Uh, within two years, um, California has the number they need. Most of the people that go out there don't find gold, but whatever. Uh, so California gets to the point of statehood really, really quickly. Okay. So because of this, because they get that number so quick, California decides to uh, try to skip the territory stage overall and just immediately apply for admission to the Union as a free state. Why is this going to make the South mad? Okay, first of all, why is uh, there? Why are they going to apply uh, as, uh, apply to join the Union as a free state? Well, it's all because of the people going there. Again, you're talking about transportation in the South, where transportation is limited. Um, you know, you don't have the ability for people to to go out west. But through trains and things, even though trains aren't yet over in the West. Uh, you know, you can easily take a train from, say, Boston to St. Louis and, um, you know, find a way to get uh, the rest of the way out to California. Um, not on the Oregon Trail, because you're not going to Oregon, but you can certainly make it out there. And it's safer now because it's not Mexico. So all the people or many of the people that are making that trip there, they tend to be from the north and northerners don't like slavery. So this is where, that, where, this is where the Wilmot Proviso comes back into play. Congress has already shown that they support this idea and the Wilmot Proviso wants to end slavery in all this, in, in all this new territory. California, of course, um, or the South rather, uh, the South is of course really upset about this because tipping the scales just a little bit gives the North an advantage, right? If we had one more state, California, and it's gonna be a free state, that gives the Senate advantage in terms of numbers to the north and uh, to free states. Uh, the slave states in the south certainly don't want that. So that's why the Wilmot Proviso is still relevant, even though it doesn't come into reality, because they showed that this is something they want, and it showed in Congress that the north supports it, the concept anyway. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, the United States in 1850, right? Here's that Missouri Compromise line. I want you to keep this, not perfect, but I want you to kind of keep that in mind, right? Look at California, okay? This is why it's a big, big question, because part of California is going to be north of that compromise line, and part of it's going to be south of that compromise line. So that's why there's even a question at all as to whether or not California can be a slave or free state. If California was all to the north, there's no question. If California was all to the south, then there would be no question it would be open to slavery. But since it cuts down the middle almost completely, then that makes it um, then that makes it a really dicey issue. So let's continue. So what we need, of course, to figure out is a compromise. And we know compromise in history is a dirty word because nobody ends up getting exactly what they want. But here's the situation. So Zachary Taylor, uh, old rough and ready, is elected president in 1848 as a Whig. He's uh, the second and final Whig to be elected president. And just like William Henry Harrison, he's ultimately going to die in office, which I'll talk about shortly. So Zachary Taylor, um, you know, even though he's from the South, he's from Louisiana, he wants California admitted as a free state right away um, to, in his mind, kind of break down any argument uh, about whether it's going to be slave or free. Let's just make it free. Zachary Taylor wasn't a big supporter of slavery. Uh, even though he was from the South, he came kind of from a came from a poor background, so he could kind of identify with the conditions of slaves a little bit. And to be honest with you, you know, he doesn't really care 
In fact, he uh, he didn't even vote um, for himself for president because he wasn't registered to vote. So even the guy that cared about that sort of thing. Uh, but he's the president, and he pushes for California to be admitted immediately as a free state. The South, of course, again, is upset by this, right? The South digs in about it. What's going to happen if California is admitted as a free state? And what has happened to remind the South that they need to balance the Senate? Events in the past, particularly the Wilmot Proviso. The South knows that if the North or if the free states get an advantage, in the Senate, it's going to make it hard for them to get legislation they want passed, for them to add more, uh, for them to add more slave states to the Union, uh, or even maybe for for the, even the continuation of the condition of slavery to continue to exist. So the South, of course, here is really um, apprehensive and really concerned about what might happen. Okay, so there you go. So the South digs in when it comes to this. So what we usually see happens begins when it comes to any compromise. The South threatens to secede, and Taylor says, okay, if you secede from the Union, we're going to send the, the whole army down there and attack the South. You cannot secede from the Union. Sounds vaguely familiar to Andrew Jackson. Um, we'll secede if you don't, and so on and so forth. So we're in a real, real pickle. We're in a real, real bad situation. And, of course, whenever we're in a situation like this, who do we turn to? Henry Clay, Henry Clay, who um, is old but still in there, still in government, he's been there for more than 40 years. Has been the secretary, has been the speaker of the house off and on since not, uh, since 1810. Um, so he comes in one more time uh, to kind of one more time step in there and save the union from utter disaster. So that's where we are. All right, so again, let's take a look at that compromise line right here. Um, get that compromise line right here. So you can tell it cuts right through California. And that's why it is such a questionable, like difficult decision uh, because of the status of, of the location of California. And we've got a really difficult balancing act going on between the slave and free states. We got California, free, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen free states now, slave states. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, Delaware. So there's that balance. Sixteen, fifteen. Uh, the advantage is with the North right now, and that, of course, makes the South really, really scared about the future of, of slavery in general, and certainly about the future of uh, the possible future of adding any new slave states to the Union, okay? Again, that's why that balance is something that, that's really, really important, okay, to the South, because if they fall behind and we get, you know, which ultimately is going to happen, because if you keep the Missouri Compromise Line, which ultimately will be gotten rid of, but whatever, all this stuff is going to be free territory. So if you still have all that, you're still talking about a lot of states. So there's really no way that the South can add more slave states based on that Missouri Compromise Line. They got the New Mexico Territory. That can be slave. Um, you can make an argument for Nevada and then California, of course. But California has already become a free state. So that's no good. Um, so, you know, they're really in a tough spot. I guess Oklahoma could be a slave state, too. But... There's no way, and that's why it was so important to the South to try to get California to be admitted as a slave state, to give them a chance uh, to kind of keep that balance as long as they can uh, in terms of slave to free state. So a little bit more on the compromise here. So like we know, in any compromise you have stuff uh, that's good for both sides. Okay, so you have things for both sides, but no side gets exactly what they want. So uh, Henry Clay comes up, throws in one last great compromise, and this one includes the following. The North gets California as a free state. That's the big prize. That's what they want. The South, or I'm sorry, uh, the North also gets the end of the slave trade, uh, the buying and selling of slaves, but not slavery in the District of Columbia which I know sounds kind of weird, 
but the uh, remember the uh, um, Washington D.C. was formed out of uh, two slave states, Maryland and Virginia. Uh, so the territory was actually the uh, or the district itself was actually um, open to slavery. Okay, so what they get here is the end of the slave trade. So that means no more buying and selling of slaves in the district. If you own slaves, you can keep them, but uh, no more buying and selling slaves. The idea here is you're going to work slavery out of the nation's capital, out of Washington, D.C., and, you know, um, optimistic Northerners think, you know, hopefully this means eventually the rest of the country will follow suit. Okay, so that's what the North gets. The South gets a couple things. One, a very uh, much stricter fugitive slave law, which basically forces Northerners to help Southern slave catchers. In other words, there's harsh penalties for um, Northerners that get in, that uh, are caught helping uh, uh, fugitive slaves, uh, you know, runaway slaves escape into the free states, uh, and kind of institutes laws that forces Northerners uh, to aid in the catching um, of slaves that escaped uh, escaped slavery. So. That's what, uh, so that's part of what, so that's one part of what happens here, okay? The South also gets, and this is an important concept, popular sovereignty to decide the question of slavery in the lands won from Mexico besides uh, California, okay? So this means the Utah Territory and the New Mexico Territory, all right? So what we're talking about here um, is that 3630 line of the Missouri Compromise is essentially no longer valid, okay? It is, but it isn't. Um, here. So popular sovereignty, again, is a really, really important idea here. So what we're talking about here now is the concept of popular sovereignty, if you don't know what that means, is essentially that the people will vote and determine laws, outcomes, uh, things like that. Popular sovereignty, like for instance, uh, when we vote for governor in Ohio, it's determined by popular sovereignty, right? Whoever gets the most votes becomes governor. In the presidential election, it isn't popular sovereignty. It's the combination of the popular vote, but really it's the electoral college that ultimately determines uh, who wins the presidency. Popular sovereignty, then, if you understand that now, is going to decide the question of slavery here. So that means that Missouri Compromise line no longer matters because the Utah Territory is uh, mostly north of um, mostly north of the Compromise line. So here's the thing, right? Popular sovereignty is very important idea in the 1850s. Okay. Why does it seem like a good idea, a fair compromise, but why is it really a bad idea? So again, I want you to respond to me with answers to those questions, and I'll give you an idea. What happens, to give you an idea to that answer, of why it, it, seems, it seems like a good idea because the South will be happy and they have a fair chance to say, hey, we're going to send people out west, we're going to send people into, um, we're going to send people into, uh, you know, these, these territories and so they can get enough population there and the pro-slavery people will vote and they'll outnumber the uh, anti-slavery people and we'll get more slave states. But at the end of the day, it's really, really a bad idea because what do we know about slavery and abolition? What did we learn from people like William Lloyd Garrison, Elijah Lovejoy and what happened to him? Uh, you know, how he was killed by the mob. There is a lot of pro-slavery folks and anti-slavery folks that aren't afraid to throw down, that aren't afraid to have, uh, you know, uh, violence determine it. So basically you're taking a bunch of angry people and you're throwing them into a territory and saying whoever gets the most people is going to win. So you're talking about a really high chance for some violence, right? If you could imagine that in today's circumstances, if you took like uh, the most like passionate Democrat Biden supporters and put them in a place with like the most crazy passionate, excuse me, Trump supporters, uh, you know, good chance there's going to be some, good chance there's going to be some words, some violence and, and, and some stuff happening there that's, that's not too good. So uh, you can imagine why this really becomes kind of an awful idea to let popular sovereignty determine. All right, so let's talk about how this balances out. 
So nobody's thrilled with the Compromise of 1850. We already know that. Compromises never make anybody super thrilled, okay? But at the same time, nobody really wants secession and war over the issue of slavery just yet. Problem, ha problem comes, President Taylor dies because he's a Whig and he's a former general. And if you're a Whig and a former general and you get elected president, you're going to die in office. So he's replaced by Millard Fillmore, who's a trash president also. Um, but anyway, uh, so Congress, um, because of Taylor's death and everything and because he supported uh, the Compromise of 1850 kind of to honor the fallen president, they just went ahead and passed the Compromise of 1850. So we're good there. So we got this new compromise that nobody's thrilled with. Nobody really wants secession or war. So we're in this really kind of tinderbox, like, okay, that's okay, but I really don't like it type situation in America. Maybe not too super different than how some people feel today. I don't think it's nearly as bad now. I don't think we're going to go have another civil war. But, you know, for perspective, you could kind of look at the way things are today and kind of get a sense for, um, you know, really passionate people about, uh, you know, Biden or Trump um, and how they might have felt about slavery or anti-slavery way back when. Okay, so what is the most important part of the compromise to the North? Okay. Northern Free Soilers, people that support the end of slavery, are okay with popular sovereignty in Utah and New Mexico territories. They're okay with that. They can live with that. That's good, okay? Um, because popular sovereignty is going to, um, you know, they believe that they can get more people there, and they probably can. They have more infrastructure. They have more railroads. They have all the stuff they need, and they have a ton more people that, you know, can be impassioned enough to say, I'm going to move out to these territories. We're going to get our population up there, and we're going to turn these places into free territories. Okay? So the most important part to, of the compromise to the north uh, is definitely getting that, that uh, crown jewel, getting California added to the United States as a free state. They can go out there, they can populate the area, and they can benefit economically from it. They can start building railroads. Maybe we can start working towards connecting the east and west by railroad, although that's that's a decade or so away still, about a decade and a half away. How about the south? What is the most important part of the compromise for the south? Well, the reality is, as much as they like the idea, popular sovereignty in Utah and New Mexico is really not going to help the south out all that much for two reasons. The opposite of the reasons why it's good for the north. Number one, they don't really have the infrastructure to be able to get out there quickly to get to the numbers needed to apply for statehood, one. And two, they just don't have the people. You know, you're talking 40% of the population of the South are slaves. They can't afford to move all these people out West because they just don't have the numbers to be able to do that, nor the ability. So popular sovereignty isn't going to help them out all that much. So what I'm basically saying is the chances of the New Mexico and, and Utah territories becoming slave territories is probably pretty slim. So what the most important part for the South, the most important part for the South uh, is definitely the, uh, the fugitive slave law because it forces the North to recognize that uh, this is the law and um, Northerners have to obey the law whether they like it or not, whether they agree with it or not. So that kind of is a win for the South uh, because now they know that the Northerners have to help them in the catching of slaves. So the hope is there's going to be fewer slaves escaping, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a spiteful thing. You know, it's kind of a spiteful thing that you say, hey, yeah, you know, you don't support slavery, but you still have to help us catch them if they escape. All right. Uh, do I have another point there? We'll see if not. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. So what I want you to answer for me also is the book clearly says that uh, the North is the clear winner in the Missouri Compromise, and I'm not so sure about that. Um, you know, you can make an argument for either side, but I want to know what you think. So uh, respond to me. 
you know, in your email response also with the other questions from before and then also this. Um, why do you think that the North is the clear winner in the Missouri Compromise? And uh, do you agree with that? Why or why not? So, okay, uh, that went on just a tad longer than I thought it would, but uh, that's it for this week. Remember, quiz on Wednesday. Packet also uh, going to be due on Wednesday for 13, and uh, that's it. So we'll see you. Have a good weekend.